Welcome to Season 4, Episode 7 of Solar Punk Presents, in which we talk to Nick Schwanz of Solar Punk Farms about regenerative farming. Welcome, Nick, one of the founders of Solar Punk Farms, a project in Northern California that involves, if I may quote your Instagram bio, a bunch of queers, activists, artists, scientists, and sustainability-minded weirdos trying to build a regenerative farm in Guerneville, California. That's uh, that's right. That describes us perfectly. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, I'm really excited to talk to you. I guess my first question is, did I say Guerneville properly? That is how you say it, right? You did. I was actually made a mental note. I was like, wow, that was the first correct pronunciation I've heard from a stranger in a while. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, I grew up in Los Angeles, which, okay, is a million miles away from Guerneville, but it's yeah. still at least in California. Sadly, the name Guerneville comes from um, the family name of the owners of the original logging industry up here. So there's a bit of a sadness to our namesake. That's true for many, many names, though. Many, many place names. So there's so much to unpack in your description of yourselves. I'm not quite sure where to start. But how about with, you know, a really easy question here, your vision of what you're trying to create with Solar Punk Farms? My husband, Spencer, and myself started Solar Punk Farms about three years ago. We both work in climate in different capacities, but we'd always sort of experienced working on climate through the computer and through books. And so we wanted to create a place that uh, sort of worked on the climate through hands-on experience. Our big vision is that we want to create a demonstration site for people to kind of see what living within regenerative values looks, feels, smells, sounds like. We always joke that the things we grow on the farm are education and inspiration for people to see how sustainable and regenerative values might shape their own life and how they can get involved in the regenerative movement. So uh, you guys bought the land for your farm in the middle of 2020, which was actually kind of a crazy time to do something like that. But I'm curious, what was the state of the property to begin with? So was it already a farm or did you have to start your endeavor absolutely, utterly from scratch? (laughs) Definitely the latter. We had been sort of vision boarding what would make us leap into this crazy adventure. And one of the biggest things that we had on our list was we wanted to find a piece of land that was in desperate need of regeneration. We had been looking around in different places in Oregon and California in 2019. And then we put a pause on it for many reasons. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we decided, you know what, now is the time to leap. And we found this degraded horse property um, in Guerneville, California. It's about 10 total acres, but only three of which are sort of flat farmable land. And, and most of that was just covered with lake sand and trampled down by horses for years and years so that there was really only nothing, there was nothing growing except for a little bit of pigweed. Oh my God, uh, like no soil whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was literally all sand. We have some great aerial shots that shows sort of what it looked like in year one. And it's just this big, brown, empty lot versus what it looks like now, which is this like incredible, vibrant green food forest. That was the biggest part of our early adventure is bringing the soil back to life. So we spent the first year taking permaculture classes, building out site plans, really listening to the land as much as we could. And then putting in process a couple of soil regeneration strategies. Part of that included doing a big double dig to get some of the sand that had been poured on top mixed into the earth below, adding oyster shell, adding different types of compost, and doing a bunch of cover cropping with nitrogen fixing and bioaccumulating plants. And it was really incredible to see the journey of that in the first couple of years. We had these great pictures of in January, where the cover crops had gotten up to, and it was about a little bit below our shins. And the following year, at the same time, it was up past our waist. And we're like, this is such a beautiful visual cue to show how much the soil has bounced back in just one year. That's amazing. I mean, because you'd think it would take forever, maybe, or I don't know. It really, I, you know what, before moving here, I would have thought the same, but it's pretty incredible how much the earth wants to be verdant and thriving. And all you need to do is just provide a couple of the right conditions. And it, it takes off on itself pretty incredibly. It was really inspiring to watch. Oh yeah, that must've been. 
So you've mentioned a little bit about this, but you know, how does one suddenly become a farmer? Because agriculture requires an extraordinary amount of knowledge. And a lot of the kind of knowledge that comes from uh, experience and also quite a bit of seriously expensive equipment. So I'm, you know, right now I'm thinking of the enormous harvesters and tractors they use around here where I live now in northern Germany, which run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros or whatever. Um, so are you, um, as the locals here would put it, learning by doing, or is there a more method to your madness than that? Um, there's definitely a little both, but I would start that off by saying we absolutely agree with you that the term farmer does not ever get enough of the credit or respect that it really deserves. And we are very careful to say that we are working on building a farm, but we do not consider ourselves farmers yet. We are farming enthusiasts. We are farming students, but by no stretch of the imagination would we say that we've learned the craft. In order to kind of get where we've gotten, we've taken a lot of classes. I took some time off of my normal job to go become an um, apprentice at a farm in our local area for a season where I learned a ton. I still have a ton to go. The scale of agriculture that we're doing really is not considered like a conventional commercial farm. We oftentimes use the term farmstead because we only have about a quarter of an acre area that's dedicated to being a market garden. And then we're building out some parts of the land to be community farms where folks in our local community that don't have access to land can grow their own plants. And then we have a big area dedicated to being a sort of permaculture-based food forest that's dedicated to perennials rather than the standard annuals that you see at a farm. So that's why Solar Punk Farms is it's a fun name, but it's a bit of a misnomer. Really what we like to describe ourselves as is a demonstration site for regenerative technologies and values. Because again, we just could not overdo how much we have respect for farmers and how we just would not be able to plop into that environment because it is it is a, a calling that takes a lifetime of learning to really do well. Yeah, I mean, you think about how many, you know, it's taken 10, 15,000 years for us to figure out how to feed all the people we can feed. Well, for better and for worse, you know, for the yeah, earth. And we're, and we're really still figuring it out. You know, even even the way that farming has changed in the past 20 years has been... Oh, it's extraordinary. Incredible. Oh, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, since the Green Revolution, which, you know, did have a lot of incredible upside in its ability to create more food for a growing population, but that sort of set in motion all of these standard farming practices for the latter half of the 20th century. And only in the past 20 years have we really learned what the shadow sides of that revolution are. And have we begun to really rethink what standard farming practices look like to be more in line with ecological limits and ecological systems rather than just focusing 100% on yield? So, you know, humans still have not figured it out, but we're getting closer every day. Yeah, well, that's good to hear. So, you know, the farmers around here are like, well, we don't want to change. We've been doing it this way forever. And you think, well, no, when you look at pesticide use, for instance, I mean, it's it just goes, it starts to go off the charts in the 1990s, which is not oh, that yeah. long ago. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so many gaps between our knowledge and our practices. Um, and I think we're just, we're really still filling that in as a society. And I think part of the reason that, a lot of the farming industry exists the way it does is because I think oftentimes people just don't think about how much food should cost. And because of a lot of the types of things we eat, because of the subsidies that our government has decided to implement, we actually don't pay enough for good food. And we pay also way too little for really bad food. And so that is to say that farming really is an industry that lives on the margins. Farmers have to, at all times, be exploiting every ounce of profit out of their business just to stay afloat. And that has created this condition where many, many farmers would like to create more sustainable and regenerative practices on their farms, but they actually functionally can't do that as a business, yeah. um, which, just, which says something that's broken about our current system, um, not necessarily our farmers. Biden administration and other sort of, you know, more progressive administrations are doing some things to rethink the sort of like meta narrative of American farming. 
But we still really do have just a huge way to go in terms of subsidizing the right things and giving people the right financial incentive packages and paying for some of the upstart costs of implementing some of these strategies in order for us to change the new or the normal of what farming looks like, especially in the States. It isn't just the US. So they have the same problems here in Europe. And, Mm. you know, you get these big grocery stores and, you know, they have a chokehold on the food prices. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the farmers can't sell the food at a price, you know, at a reasonable price to keep the farm going. And so it's this real, it's this race to the bottom. And so then, but, but on the other hand, the politicians are like, well, the farmers are producing enough food. We don't want to mess with that. We don't want to have hunger. We don't want to have famine. And we need the cheap prices because the a lot of people don't earn enough money. And so they can't yeah. pay more money. And so it's, it's a real pickle. You know, we don't have to get into it in this podcast, obviously, but that that many people don't earn enough money to pay for the appropriate food prices is another huge problem that we could spend multiple hours talking about. And as soon as you start messing with these sorts of things, then you have the people rising up in revolution. And I mean, and the politicians are terrified of that. So uh, yeah, it'll be interesting how we we change the direction of the ship. So let me ask you, uh, what has been the hardest thing so far about starting your endeavor? Uh, so many things (laughs) um it's been an amazing adventure but there it's definitely not been without its very very big challenges i would say for me an interesting one is i spent the past 15 years working in san francisco and i was a strategy consultant for different types of technology companies never really something i chose but something i sort of fell into and this was the best possible change for me because i actually interestingly moved at a speed that I didn't know was so draining to me. And now moving up to this farm and thinking about, you know, all the plans we want to implement and all of the things we want to build and all these things we want to grow. One of the big challenges has been me slowing down and realizing that life sort of has to move at the speed of ecology. And that feels really challenging when you're thinking about life moving at the speed of capitalism. (laughs) And so it's been a huge challenge, but it's also been a huge growth opportunity for me to really just think about time in a totally different way and be more patient with myself and with my work and and think about things on much longer time scales. Before, for such a long time, if I if I wanted to get something done, it had to be done by the end of the day or the end of the week. And now when we go to set up a project, we're like, well, this will be done by the end of the year, or, you know, when we plant a tree, we're like, well, this is, this is going to be done in 15 years. So it's, it's been just really challenging, but in a, in a wonderful heart opening way to redefine my relationship with time and productivity on the farm. Isn't it amazing that people have managed to breed different varieties, for instance, of fruit trees, like look Mm. at all the different types of apples you have, because that must be a multi-generational process. Oh, I mean, it's it's wild. There are some fantastic podcasts about apples specifically. Apples, interestingly, are sort of every type of apple that you have is unique. I mean, any any time an apple breeds within our apple tree, you're creating a new apple variety. And there is so much research and development that goes into into apples. There's you should look up a, a podcast. I think it's on the Radio Lab podcast a long time ago, but it talks about the whole history of the Cosmic Crisp that came out in the mid teen 2000 teens, but it had been in development since the 90s. To think about the impact that ecological projects have requires a decade long, sometimes generational long lens. My husband and I keep laughing because we've had our trees in the ground now for you know three years and they're still mostly hip or shoulder high. And we keep laughing about all the all the jams that we're going to make and how cute our farm stand's going to be. <laughs> and blah, blah. And we're like, you know what? We planted these trees for our kids. <laughs> and, and that's just the reality of food forest design. Yeah, but eventually they do grow up and then suddenly they're super tall and, and then you've, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, it's that relationship with time thing, you know? Um, the first year, honestly, I was like, oh my goodness, this is going to be forever. What are we doing? And now <laughs> we're on year three. We harvested our first apple last year. Woo! I was like, it's happening. Oh, what kind of, so what kind of apple was it? 
Um, this one was a, it's called a ghost apple. Um, we have about, we have about 11 or 12 different apple trees, all different varieties here. And I, I couldn't begin to tell you all of them without my list in front of them. But um, this was a, a beautiful um, sort of golden, golden white apple. Perfect with peanut butter, which is my favorite breakfast. Ah, excellent. <laughs> excellent. Has that also been the most surprising thing you've learned during the process of growing up your farm, this time aspect? I don't think so. I think the most surprising thing I've learned is just the, the true depth of information and experimentation and data that is possible with soil. One of the most remarkable things that people don't understand is that our entire life is reliant upon dirt and the vast majority of people just don't get that that ecosystem is the foundation for our ecosystem. And it's sort of like a, pardon the unintentional cliche, but it's a wormhole. <laughs> <laughs> and you go, you keep getting deeper and deeper into it and realizing just how much complexity and nuance and possibility and diversity is going on in the soil at any given time and how many different things you can tinker with and and what things you can add to it and what things you can withhold from it and all these things to just create all these different interactions in the soil. And that to me was shocking. I knew it was complex, but I had no idea how complex. Uh, we've got this really beautiful worm composting um, setup. The sort of sciencey name is vermicompost. That has been a really cool operation because we now blend up all of our food waste and we put it into this thing. It's about like 15 pounds of food waste a day. We've got almost 100 pounds of worms in there. And they're churning out this beautiful black worm casting that we can then make all these different types of teas out of. And then you add that to the soil and watching how brilliantly the the plants change once you add that is just so cool. I mean, like it's all it's all happening in the soil. About 30 years ago, I, I knew a soil scientist, um, a professor at, at uh at UC Berkeley, named Ron Amundsen. I, I, I assume he's retired by now. Who knows? Scientists, actually, they never fade away. They never um, fade away. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he was, all, he loved soil. There's one soil in California that he was lobbying for it to be like the official California state soil. And I don't remember what it is. I think it's in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, but he was like, but you know, there's none left anymore. Because as yeah. soon as you start tilling it and adding chemicals to it and adding fertilizers, it's not the soil type that it used to be before. Hey, I'm breaking in to say that I have just learned that uh, the effort to establish the San Joaquin soil as California state soil was actually successful already in 1997. But again, because the soil has so been so heavily tilled and so pumped full of fertilizers and, and pesticides, that chemically and bacteriologically and in terms of all the little invertebrates living in the soil, it's not the soil that it used to be. Um, and so you can argue whether or not the San Joaquin soil actually still exists or whether it's all been modified. Well, probably not beyond all recognition, but it's definitely not the soil it was in its natural state. Now back to the episode. Yeah, it's, it's honestly so crazy what, how California has changed over the past 200 years. There's a deeply interesting but truly devastating book called Tending the Wild that's actually a, a history of California and California land stewardship as told through the indigenous lens. And the whole beginning of the book talks about what the landscape and the ecosystems and the waterways and the soil and the fauna used to look like before the mm -hmm. arrival of white settlers. Some of the pictures that they paint are just, they bring you to tears out of beauty at first, and then they bring you to tears out of sadness once you kind of realize where we are now. Humans have an unprecedented ability to change everything about the land that they sit on, and soil is absolutely no exception. I think we use something like 40% of Earth's land area for agriculture, some crazy number like that. Hey, I'm breaking in again to fact check myself. Humans have taken over 39% of Earth's land area, and 97% of the land that we use is used for agriculture, not anything else. So that means our agriculture takes up 37% of Earth's land area. 
Now, if you take out the non-arable land, like deserts and really steep mountains, agriculture is using 55% of the arable land on Earth. And the rest of that land is currently taken up by forests. There's also just a lot of really scary studies right now going on about how fast we're losing topsoil. The most dire estimates, you know, give at least American Midwest farmers another 50 or 60 years, maybe, of topsoil at the current types of farming practices. And so much of that is, you know, as a result of over tilling and monoculture and pesticide use and pumping things filled with artificial fertilizers, essentially not having stuff in the ground at all times makes it so that soil can run away, blow away. And because so much of the arable land is currently being used for farming practices where there isn't stuff in the ground all the time, it's just you plant it, you tear everything out, and then you replant it, right? It's not part of normal ecosystems. We just have a huge amount of topsoil loss. And it takes a long time for that topsoil to come back, a long time in the right conditions for that topsoil to come back. So, And, and soil, that topsoil, yeah. it's critical because that's where the plants grow best? Absolutely. Yeah, that's where that's where the plants grow best. That's sort of like the first frontier of the of the flora that exists with us, right? Pioneer plants grow on the topsoil and also, you know, bigger, you know, more complex plants will eventually get deeper down, but so much of the, the sort of pioneer species really thrive and require that topsoil. And yeah, I, I mean almost all of the food that we grow and eat as humans, all, all of the annuals, you know, most of the stuff we see in the, the supermarkets, the vegetables we see in the supermarkets, yeah, that requires good, healthy topsoil. Yeah, it is definitely. Oh, I won't say it. I won't say food for thought, but it is definitely food for thought. <laughs> um, well, I'd love to talk about the agricultural aspects but uh, all day, but we only have a limited amount of time. So let me ask <laughs> you about the queer aspects of solar punk farms. We've gotten this question a lot because I think a lot of people are like, why does queerness matter in farming or sustainability? And at first, I think it does sound kind of like a, a weird, you know, strange bedfellows. But the way we sort of think about it is queerness, not necessarily just as sexual identity, but queerness more as the idea of a group of people that find themselves in a place where they don't fit into the status quo is what we mean by queerness in sexual identity and you know gender identity that means not being cis straight right and that's the thing that we think of but in our context it also means like not buying into the capitalist principles and it it just means basically a group of people who are very interested in subverting the status quo in order for them to live healthy fulfilling and you know self-actualized lives and so if, if you kind of zoom out on what queer means to that lens it's very easy to see how this fits into both agriculture and climate there are so many people who are saying this is the right way to do agriculture and the queer lens on that is no that's not right let us show you sort of what the rebellious different perspective on that looks like and from climate and sustainability standpoint that very much is about a life opposite of capitalist values um, and principles. Yeah, and so I, I would say that's point number one really is sort of this, this inverse relationship with the status quo and the ability to challenge that proudly and excitedly. But there are other really cool things too. And I would say this is more about what we take and learn from the queer movement that's happened over the past 40 or 50 years. Queer people have been absolutely incredible at organizing and pushing against systemic oppression in a way that produces really, really positive results. Yeah. And, and providing alternatives. Exactly. Providing alternatives and putting pressure on governmental institutions to create the change that is needed to keep people healthy, right? The AIDS crisis is just absolutely filled with unbelievably brave, unbelievably creative, unbelievably stout-hearted queer people who changed the world through their activism. And we want to be able to like learn from that group and channel some of that energy and just 
direct it towards a new emergency. And so I think that is a really big part of the spirit. And then the last thing that we really love and has sort of been coming up organically too is I think the queer community is really good at raucous, silly, creative joy, especially in the face of looming threats. And that's one of the huge things that we want to manifest here at the farm. I think for a long time, people have thought sustainability is a scary obligation. It's something that we have to do because something's broken. The end of the earth is something that we're running from. And we want to pivot that narrative a lot to be like, a regenerative life is actually something that you get to do. It's all of these different ways for your life to be better and more interesting and more enriching. It's so if you do it in you know the way we want to bring it to life, it's fun and silly and sexy and goofy and weird. And that is something that you should desire. It's a carrot. It's not a stick. Queer people have been so unbelievable at showing how silliness and joy and play can live in activism movements. And, and so that's, that's something that we're trying to bring to, to our lives every day of the week. Oh, wow. I love that. That is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, we had such a great, perfect example. My grandma, who is just an angel and I've never loved a woman more in my life. Um, she was like, she has, she's born and raised in Iowa. She has um, two of her three brothers are gay. One of her brothers and his partner had a farm in Iowa and she's had this amazing special relationship with this queer farm in Iowa um, for her entire life. And her brother recently passed away and what she wanted to do for her birthday was come out to our queer farm and have a drag show. And so we came out and we had, we set up a big drag show and it was all like farm and barnyard animal themed. And the amount of energy and fun and silliness that came out of that event was so magical to see. And I'm like, why are, why do all of these things, why does earth and agriculture and farmers and drag show all work together? And I'm like, I don't know, but it does. <laughs> and there's, something, and there's something so special about it. And, and that energy was like, when it clicked for me and I'm like, this is, this makes what we're doing fun in a way I've never really seen in other agricultural or rural spaces. Oh, that must have been that must have been quite a party. It was it was quite <laughs> a party. <laughs> um, so uh, now tell me about the solar punk part. Although mm -hmm. obviously these things are very overlapping here. We were introduced to solar punk shortly before we moved up uh, to the farm, and the way we sort of see solar punk is, it is a reaction to other genres like cyberpunk and steampunk that look at the world through a lens of sort of the natural world and the technolog technological human world being at odds with each other. And in classic genre style, they they map out the future, they storytell about the future. And in all of those futures, it's dystopian, it's bleak. There's all of this like horrible conflict. These genres have actually really influenced the way humans look at the future over the past 50 years, right? Like, you look at things like Mad Max and Blade Runner and everything, and these, these things have really shaped what we think the future could look like. And I think the people who really started thinking about solar punk early, this has been a movement that's been going on for quite some time with amazing thinkers and activists behind it. Not at all something that my husband and I started. Um, just want to make that clear. But <laughs> the reaction was, well, why don't, why don't we have something good to look forward to? What if we imagined the future in a way that nature and the and the ecological world and human and the technological world actually were complementary forces and not conflicting forces what would the future look like then and so it started out a little bit more as an architectural movement i think but it's really quickly moved from architecture to art to storytelling and now interestingly enough over the past 10 years it's really turned into an activism um, movement and sort of a philosophy we always say that the big question asked by solar punk is what does an ecological civilization look like and how do we get there? And how do we feed them all? It, it, truly, truly, right? That's part of the, how do we get there? Right? So it, it really is, you know, it's a, it's a combination of art, philosophy, technology, ecology, 
sociology, politics, but all sort of aimed at this. How do we live in a world where humans and the ecosystems upon which we rely make each other better and take care of each other in ways that are really interesting and fulfilling to both parties? And so that's that's sort of solar punk in a nutshell. That's sort of why we were so inspired by it is that we know that we're too small and we're too inexperienced, too new with this to say that the actual land management or the food that we grow is what's going to make a difference. But we are both storytellers in our previous lives. And we look at this place not as some, not as a, an agricultural farm that's going to make things. But again, like I said at the beginning, we really think about education and inspiration being the products. We want pe to educate people and inspire people to want to build the same future that we see. I think it really all comes back to this carrots and sticks thing that I mentioned, right? The whole sustainability movement thus far has been around getting people to run away from a stick. And solar punk is such a good opportunity for to get people to run towards a carrot. Um, <laughs> and, and that comes from showing people what the carrot looks like, telling people what it could feel like, getting people to experience, you know, a, a taste of that potential future and then tell them, if you want more of this, here's all of the things that we can do. So yeah, that's, that's sort of our thinking around it. So, so what kind of events do you have then? Or are you just kind of getting started with this stuff? We, we are just kind of getting started with this stuff. So another, a, a silly, interesting challenge has been sort of the red tape of doing anything in the event space in Sonoma County. <laughs> Uh, but we've been getting over those hurdles. And this year, actually, we're really excited to do our big first year of awesome events. One example of that is we're in the middle of planning a, what we're calling Guerneville Fashion Week. And we want to, during the times of all the other fashion weeks, show actually what regenerative fashion looks like. And so we're going to have a big sort of fun event where we have local clothing makers who only use upcycled or saved fabric come up. We're going to have sewing classes that teach people how to mend or upgrade their current clothes. We're going to have a big clothing swap where people can bring old stuff that's new to other people. We'll have a big fashion show where people can kind of show off what they've made. But basically we want to, we want to just say that fashion is one of the most wasteful industries in the world, which is crazy because if we just looked at how much material material we've already created, we would not need to make anything new for the next forever. And there are so many incredible designers and makers and tinkers out there that are looking at textiles in ways that isn't extractive, that all the fashion industry needs is a little bit of a switched lens in order to be a much more sustainable industry. And so we want to start creating a place that celebrates that type of lens on fashion. That's one example. One of that's just purely in the fun. We have a, a really big natural wine festival out here every year where we feature a bunch of the people who are growing wines in really um, natural, biodynamic, organic ways, um, which is a ton of fun. Um, we're looking at doing lots of speaker series, um, lots of workshops, things we call work play weekends, which is where people come up either from the city or adjacent counties and we work on a land project and you can learn sort of how a berm building process works or uh, we're in the process of building out this big hugel culture model in the front of the land right now. And so we're having people up in February to, to come learn how that works. So we just want to be sort of a constant beehive of fun activities that feel aligned with our values, but also just like fun and silly and desirable and aspirational uh, we're we're just getting started, but the ideas have not stopped coming. So this must be an extraordinary amount of work. So you you know you've got you're at least to some degree running a farm, and yet at the same time you're also a node connecting people together. Yeah. I mean, and this and so you have to you have to find people and network with them and plan these events. And I mean, this must be extra an extraordinary amount of work. <laughs> it, it is an extraordinary amount of work. I'm so happy about where we've gotten to in the last couple of years. So the first three years, my husband and I both, we have our full-time jobs. And so we've been doing this sort of with our spare resources and our spare time. Oh my God. So that's even crazier. It's been crazy. Yeah. But luckily about a month ago, we were contacted by an incredible 
organization called Fulcrum Arts. And they they fiscally sponsor interesting programs that they feel passionate about and allow them to run as a nonprofit and raise money as a nonprofit. So as of December, we are a fiscally sponsored program from Fulcrum Arts, and that's allowed us to begin fundraising so that we can do a couple of really key things. The first off is hire two more people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so we're going to actually hire a full-time farm manager, somebody that knows much more than us. Um, we're going to also hire a full-time events manager. And then it'll also help us ramp up some of our land regeneration projects. And hopefully it'll also give us more flexibility to put some of our time and energy to this in a more dedicated way. 2024 will be a massive shift in how we are able to use our resources to make this vision come alive. And I think we will make really huge strides. But yeah, the, the other part of your question that I really love and I think is important is that so much of so much of what we do is exactly about connecting other people. And it's not necessarily about us or this space. We have this little diagram that we drew where we're like, what are what is the what is the impact that we want to have? And we ended up having like a bunch of concentric circles. The smallest one is the land. You know, that's where we're better tending to the redwood forest behind us because it really has not been taken care of for many, many years. And it needs a lot of work in order to be fire prepared. There's a lot of trees that have fallen down and we need to cut those and, and pack those in order to stop soil degradation from crazy rains, you know, and then there's the soil that we actually have on the farm. That's one whole thing, but it's a really, really small part of our impact. Beyond that, then we have our town right? We, we are part of a very close-knit community here, and we want to have a good impact that allows our local businesses to thrive, that gives people who want to, you know, grow stuff, give them access to that. We want to be able to influence town policies about what we value as a community. And then beyond that is our Sonoma County community. You know, we have this vision of making Sonoma County the most solar punk county on the planet, a place that people come to because they want to see what a solar punk future looks like. And so we've been doing a lot of work with the Sonoma County Tourism Board. I've joined the Economic Development Board of Sonoma County, and we've really been putting a lot of work into sort of shaping that ecosystem towards regenerative values. And then, you know, there's the bigger Bay Area community where it's like, we really just want to connect people who believe in this stuff. We want people to get inspired. We want people to start their own ideas. And then there's the global community that we really think of as the online community. And so, so much of what we really want to do too is about sort of just creating knowledge nuggets and putting out content and making zines and, and facilitating conversations and being on podcasts and stuff that just get people talking about what solar punk is and its role in our collective future. The land stuff, the work, the stuff that we work on with our hands every day is important, but it's at the center of what we see as a, a much broader opportunity for impact through this project. Uh, this might be a little bit off topic, but listening to you um, explain this, it just made me think solar punk takes a lot of money. It does. And whenever, you know, so I was in Hamburg, which is about an hour from here. I don't know, a couple months ago. And there's, you know, there's this one part of, I don't know Hamburg very well, but it stumbled upon this one part of town that looks totally solar punk. And then you realize it's where all of the millionaires and billionaires live. Yeah. Right. So how, how do you think we can bring this into, uh, I don't want to say the poor neighborhoods, but you know, to the people who don't have enough money to live in a, a city that's got all these amenities? Yeah. I think, I think it's a big challenge that we need to sort of, explore for the solar punk movement because i i don't think that that has to be true i think that that's definitely the way that solar punk has been absorbed thus far and i think one of the reasons that that's happened is because the easiest way that people can grab wrap their brain around solar punk right now especially on our like fast media world is they want to see pictures and the pictures that are being shown are the pictures of these hyper futuristic super, super complex green architecture projects. When you Google solar punk, you're just going to see a bunch of city, like futuristic cityscapes. And I agree, when you look at that, you're like, where do those resources come from? But there's also so many elements of a solar punk future that actually don't look or feel like that or rely upon resources in the same way. 
I would encourage any of your listeners to Google um, the Solar Punk Manifesto. And it actually sort of goes through a bunch of bullet points of what makes up a solar punk philosophy. One of the one of our favorite ones is this um, Indian principle called Jugad. And it literally means using what you have on hand and thinking about creative use and engineering based on just what's in your space. In permaculture, one of the principles is use what's on site. Truly one of the most solar punk things that you can do is think about a problem that you have and then think about the solution as limited by the materials and resources that you already have. There, I think, are, are just a ton of aspects of solar punk that, that really aren't about groundbreaking technology or impressive structures. That's just what the storytelling thus far has given us the opportunity to see. So that's point one. And then the next point I would say is that a lot of the things that we do see, they do require a lot of money, but there's also that money is being spent. That money is out there. It doesn't require net new money to do something solar punk. It requires that the people who are spending these big amounts of money on big infrastructure projects are doing it with certain values in mind. If you're going to make a building solar punk, you don't need $150 million to build that building. That building is going to be built anyway. You just need somebody to spend that $150 million in the correct way. And that's why I think this is much less about political infrastructure plan and much more about a set of cultural values that influence everything that we do, not just a specific project. So I would say that those are two of the big challenges that the movement has in front of it. But I think we have the right solutions. Now we just need to storytell in the right way. What sorts of things are you growing on your solar punk farm? Oh my goodness, this is my favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, right now, the the majority of the land that we have is dedicated towards a food forest. And so a food forest sounds pretty straightforward and it mostly is, but generally a food forest is a small ecological system that has a bunch of different layers of perennial plants to it. So there's something referred to as the canopy layer, and that's like the taller trees most of them should be creating food, hence it's being a food, or hence it's a food forest. But that's the that's the layer that sits on top of the ecosystem. Then you can either have like a sub canopy layer of smaller trees um, that live below that, and then you have something called your shrub layer, and so that's like your bushes and your canes and your vines and um, everything. And then you have your ground cover layer. And so if you look at the system and sort of those four layers, you can start to piece together. Okay, well, what kind of plants do I want to have? all living here and how do we lay everything out in a way that creates the most possible density and diversity ideally a system that sort of takes care of itself and so you have to think about all these different types of things like you think of food production right fruits and nuts and avocados and all this stuff but then you want to think about the other types of essential parts of a, a food system so it's like do we need pollinators what kind of plants are going to bring pollinators in what kind of um, plants are going to bring the wildlife that's really beneficial for this space in? Uh, what kind of plants are going to cover the ground and make sure that the, the sun doesn't dry out the soil too fast? There's a lot of plants that mitigate pests like fennel and garlic and marigolds. All of these plants are really good at keeping out some of the bad pests that you don't want. And then there's plants that bring up nutrients from really deep down and bring it up to the top of the soil. So it's kind of like a fun puzzle piece that you work together. And so we're at the beginning of that where we've planted about 80 or 90 trees that will ultimately be our canopy layer. We've planted a handful of small shrubs. Every little tree is going to get its individual guild that just consists of a bunch of different types of plants that work great for that tree. That food forest project is going to be ongoing over the next many years to get it to where we want it to be. But that's a big fun part that's been my favorite passion project. And then we have a market garden area where we've been doing a lot of sort of expected things, but we're zoning in on what we like the best. Our soil right now has been creating the most incredible tomatoes. And it's a cliche for a farm, but it's made just the most incredible crop of tomatoes I've ever tasted. Um, we're also specializing in growing a lot of 
uh, like I mentioned earlier, dried flowers. Um, so flowers that hold up for a really long time. Again, one of our sustainability principles is like, let's make things last. Let's give stuff long life. And so one of our favorite things is straw flower, which is a really beautiful, vibrant flower that basically if you dry it upside down and it holds its color for years. And then we're doing lots of other things. We're doing, you know, peppers and tomatoes and garlic and all of the herbs and just the expected stuff because we want to be able to have our market garden essentially fuel all of the food at the events that we do down the road. The real question is, what aren't we growing? Okay, but you're mainly focusing on fruits, vegetables, and flowers. We're mainly focusing on fruits, vegetables, and flowers, but we also have, you know, a ton of space here that we want to dedicate to natives. And so we're building a big hedgerow in the front of the land right now that we're dedicating to California natives, like different types of Ceanothus and different types of Madrone and Manzanita, different types of oak species. So every, every zone on the farm is going to be a, a slightly, is going to have slightly different objectives and therefore slightly different plants. With the goal of ultimately when somebody shows up at the farm, they can wander around and see all of these different ecological things going on and learn about it almost like different rooms in a museum. Oh, that's fantastic. I love what you're doing. I will be following your story very closely because oh, I think this awesome. is fantastic. Yeah. Um, how can our listeners support you guys? A couple of ways. I think the easiest way is to follow along. Uh, we are Solar Punk Farms on Instagram. And that's where most of our sort of community huddles. Uh, the other thing would be to really just like deep dive into the solar punk world. Our mission is to get everybody to be in love with that philosophy. If you're reading the solar punk manifesto and, you know, learning about the movement and telling your friends about the movement, that's amazing. I think another thing would just be start to think about growing stuff on your own and like rethinking your food in a way that feels much more local and personal to you. That would be massive. And then for those of you out there who are interested or able, you know, we are officially operating as a nonprofit and on our Instagram page, you can see where you can donate to the organization to help us do some of our big 2024 initiatives. But, you know, not everybody's able to do that. And um, I think the biggest thing for us really is about learning more about solar punk and talking to people in your community about it to see what kind of cool stuff pops up wherever you are. And then if they're interested in some of your events, they can find out about them on your Instagram page. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We have our Instagram page is sort of the front page for everything that we do. We're very much millennials in that way. Um, <laughs> we're launching our website later this year, but everything we do, all of our communication, all the events that we set up, all can be found on Instagram. Okay, super. Well, thank you very, very much for this quick introduction to Solar Punk Oh my Farms. goodness. Thank I you really... so much for having me. It was great chat. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So, okay. Thanks. Fantastic. All right. Have a great rest of your day. Ah, uh, you too. And that's a wrap for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to Solar Punk Presence, a podcast hosted and produced by Ariel Kroon and Christina De La Rocha. The audio for this episode was recorded in part on the traditional territory of the neutral Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. And in Germany. The opening and closing music for this podcast is Water Cooler Gang by Monkey Warhol, available for use under the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International License. Don't forget to support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash solarpunkpresence. Every little bit helps us keep bringing you discussions and interviews. Until the next episode, keep dreaming. And stay solarpunk. <laughs>